My name is uh, John Bendella. I work for uh, TransUnion uh, Risk and Alternative Data Solutions down in uh, Boca Raton. And I'm going to be talking about CPP Components, a modern portable C++ component system. Just a little bit about my background. I started with uh, C++ when I was in eighth grade. Uh, I convinced my parents to buy me Visual C++ 1.0 and then looked at the manual and said, what in the world is Calt? Then in 96, I was like, what in the world is Iterator? And um, so I got more and more into it. I uh, went to undergrad at University of Florida. There I got involved with uh, Boost and uh, ended up uh, doing Boost Tokenizer. Um, and after that, I went to medical school. And uh, there after that, I did um, I did actually neurosurgery for a little bit. So, so that's me right there. And we're doing a awake uh, open craniotomy, which is doing brain surgery on people while you're awake. Uh, after six years of doing that, I decided to go into something that had a little less scary undefined behavior. So here I am. <laughs> All right, so. Um, I gave a, a talk for a, a, a lower level portion of this, and uh, you know I gave the whole talk, and then you know one of the questions at the end was why does anybody need this? So I wanted to just a little bit address that address that uh, up front. Why, why do why do we want or need a C++ component system? Well, header only libraries are popular. Um, if, uh, if you remember from the library in a week that, you know, when they were talking about the design goals or not goals, one of the things was a question about whether it'd be a header-only library. And in the Boost documentation, they're saying, saying, hey, we have a bunch of header-only libraries, you don't have to build them. And um, so why is that? Well, build systems. I mean, I'm sure you can think of a lot more. There's CMake, Boost Build, SCONS, Generate Your Project, Auto Tools Make, MS Make. MS Build, QMake, QBS, and I'm sure that uh, you can think of some open source project or some other project that you would like to use or have used that had a different build system than the rest of your thing, and so you spend a lot of time you know, trying to get it to work together. Um, well, uh, another reason why is um, in the, uh, I think the Going Native talk back in 2012, Herb Sutter talked about his portable C++ library project. Here's his slide. Was a large set of useful and current libraries available on all major platforms, shipped with and supported by C++ implementations, and composable using consistent types. Basically, you wanted de facto availability on all, on, as part of all major uh, compiler products. You know, as, as a way around this, you know, building everything and not having everything, and you know, why does you know why did the other languages have just much bigger uh, C++ standard libraries? The reality, you know, I mean, you know, regex has been the standard for how long, and now it's you know shipping with, I think GCC 4.9, and there's other parts of the standard library. The fact is, you know, different. You know, the compiler vendors, the standard library vendors, they're going to have different priorities than you. And just depending on them to throw a huge amount of stuff that, that they may find even peripheral into the standard library and expecting them to build it, support it, and ship it, you know, may not be all that practical. Um, what else, why else uh, for uh, C++ components? Well, package managers. Many languages, package, uh, Python, Node.js, Ruby, Perl, they've all got their package managers. Um, they greatly simplify you know, discovering a library, installing a library, using a library. However, with C++, you know, most of these you'll notice they're interpreted. C++ has a problem with, you know, you gotta provide a pre-compiled binary. And you know the way with the ABI now, you've got to basically pre-compile a binary for every platform, compiler, standard library, and maybe even debug and release build. Uh, if you want, you know, something instructive, this is especially, you know, especially an issue on Windows. Go to like the Qt project downloads and look at their downloads and just count how many, you know, how many how many of the builds are for. Windows, and each one of them has to be, you know, built, tested, and maintained. Um, so basically, if we can provide a stable ABI, we can have a pre-compiled binary per platform, which is a much more feasible option than having a pre-compiled binary uh, for every compiler standard library. Yes, question. Uh, wouldn't it be possible at least to get a 
this off the ground by offering a package management at source level. So we could just say, I need this library, bring whatever it depends on, and I'll build it. Um, I mean, we could have, you know, the package management at source level, but like I said, uh, you know, the issue is the build systems, like, you know, what build system are you going to use that? How are you going to test it? You know, when do you update? You know, like I said, that would be a, th you know, start off the ground, but, you know, it, like I said, it would, it would be, you know, at least part of the way there. Like I said, you know, at least that would be a start. We don't even have that at, at this point, moment. The question was, you know, can we start this, you know, as a as a partial measure, just of at least having a, a uh, source level package management, which uh, we currently uh, do not now. Okay. And the next part is plugins and extensions. So let's say you write write this piece of software. I mean, there, there's a whole host of things you can write, and where plugins are useful. However, you either you have a choice. You can either make your you know your plugin interface you know just a C ABI interface. You lose a lot of the niceties of the C++, including the automatic memory management. You know, being able to pass you know the stuff that you're used to, like string and vector and other stuff across. And you can do that. The advantage of that is you've got, you know, ABI compatibility, ABI stability. And, um, you know, if people from, you know, across, doesn't matter, they can use their compiler of their choice and the standard library of their choice. Uh, however, you know, if you decide to do, oh, you know, I want a more C++ component system, well, you know, you've tied yourself to maybe one library, one standard implementation, and they either have it, then if you decide to upgrade libraries, you know, everybody else is going to have an issue. All right, finally, like even if you decide, okay, I'm going to stick with a single compiler and a single standard library, you know, it's still very easy to break ABI compatibility. If you don't believe me, I mean, uh, KDE maintains a list of, you know, the stuff that you m can and cannot do to, you know, maintain your ABI compatibility across versions. And along the same line is even if you decide to stick with a given compiler, the next compiler version may or may not have the same ABI compatibility. This is a huge, you know, big thing on Windows where Microsoft uh, makes a point that, uh, you know, the given different versions are not ABI compatible, compatible with each other. And even in uh, GCC, you know, there's going to be the issue with, you know, with uh, STD string. I believe the current standard libc++ is a uh, reference counted implementation, and the standard, you know, basically with C++11 explicitly disallows that. So, I mean, so when that, if they, you know, when the Mac make this change, there's going to be a huge amount of ABI breakage for, you know, everybody that uses STD string. All right, so, so what can we do? How can uh, CPP components help us? So it's on GitHub, jbandela slash CPP components. It's got a boost license. You can do, you know, um, you know, commercial, open source, whatever you want. Uh, it's header only. Um, I tested it on Windows and on Linux. So Windows is tested with uh, G++ 4.8.2 and MSVC 2013. On Linux, I tested with G++ 4.8.2 uh, and against Clang with libc++. Uh, I haven't tested it on a Mac due to not having a Mac, but there, there, it should be relatively simple to port. All right, let's look at a demonstration. So last year, I, I tried to put up a bunch of code on PowerPoint slides, which ended up with, I think, probably a lot of people going blind after this conf after my talk. Uh, so, give me a second. All right, can everybody see that okay? All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a person. And um, we're, we're going to basically put a person with get name and a set name. And then we'll go from there. And we're passing in std string and, um, you know, returning std string, passing in std string. Um, for now, you know, there's other types we, we could probably use, but, you know, we'll just say string for that one. So this is, this is how we do it. First, we need to define the interface 
and um, you know, how the interface goes together. So include CPP components, include our header file. So we create the interface, which is a struct iPerson, and uh, derive it from a, from a template called CPP components define interface. And to, we pass a UUID to it. And CPP component UUID provides a way to define a compile time uh, basically, define a UUID at compile time so it has a separate type, uh, but also do it in a canonical form. So basically, you, you can just do like a UUID gen on Windows or Linux and just put an OX in front of everything and replace the dashes with a comma and just plug it in there. So then we declare our function just like you would regularly. You string get name, set name, you can declare other stuff. You know, there's a whole host of other types you can use in Q if you wanted a vector of strings, if you wanted you know, a tuple of different strings or st tuple of strings and ints, you can all use that. And then you, you know, use this macro, passing in the person name, the get name, and the set name. So this defines our interface. So th we're gonna make this you know, portable across compilers. Uh, then what we want to do is, so last year I talked a lot about, during my talk, I talked a lot about all the stuff that go into making an interface um, uh, portable across different compilers. So now we want to level up from the interface in terms of how we can, you know, use it. So we want to create like a, a runtime class. So if you're familiar with uh, COM or WinRT, some of the, familiar, some of the um, terminology may be a little familiar. Uh, like I said, this uses some of the same concepts and terminology, but the implementation is, is completely different. So we create a runtime class. Um, this is our ID for the runtime class. We'll go over more what this means in a, in a little bit. And then we pass in object interfaces. Say it's got an object interfaces of iPerson, and this is a variadic template. And we call this our person runtime class. And then we type def a use runtime class with a uh, type def def to person. So a runtime class basically takes a bunch of interfaces and turns them into a coherent whole. And uh, use runtime class, you know, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Any questions at this point? Okay, so next we talk about how we're going to implement that. Okay, so this is our implementation. We include where the interface was defined. And then we just say implement person. CPP components derived from implement runtime class. Uh, it's kind of like the curiously recurring template parameter. Pass back in our implement person. And pass in the person runtime class that we uh, had initially. And then we just put in the names. Just get name, return name, set name, return name. Set name and name equals S. Um, we call this thing to make sure our, our implement person is registered with this module. And then we put in CPP components define factory. And um, any questions on that so far? Yes? Um, sir, uh, the question is, I'm, I'm passing the, con the, uh, the standard uh, string by, by value instead of const reference. Uh, partially intentional, partially, you know, to make, keep the example simple. Uh, basically, the, the problem is you can't pass by reference because you don't know the internals of each, you know, of how the thing is implemented across the different standard libraries. Um, the way around that is actually with, uh, there's actually, it supports, uh, I've got a version of string ref, which is pretty close to like, you know, I think the proposed standard string ref. And for that one, you know, you can, you know, as long as you're, you're you know, it's a reference, you know, it's past that. So basically, you know, it's a lot cheaper. So we, we can do that. You know, in this case, we could have done string refs everywhere. I just wanted to, for just, you know, just for demonstration purposes, you know, but like I said, you can replace them with string ref if you want and then keep everything, this, you know, everything else the same. So then our payoff comes here. 
this is how you use it. Include person. This constructs it. And this calls it. And now, you know, even though it looks like that, it has basically reference type semantics. And, you know, you can out output that. You know, you're not casting the car. And, um, and basically, so it's a little bit complicated to def define your interfaces and runtime classes, less so to implement them, and, you know, even less to use them. You know, which is, you know, which is kind of where we want to, you know, it's, you know, even if the library is a little bit hard to develop, the use should be easy. Any questions? All right. And then, um, you know, this, this code all built, and uh, I, I compiled this file with uh, G++, and compiled the DLL with uh, Microsoft Visual Studio. And um, this outputs, hello, you know, this outputs John. Yes. I guess I'm, I'm missing something. The, the implementation is built with Microsoft, so it's a DLL. So you're, what, what, where are you running this? I'm sure. Not, I'm I'll show you. Absolutely. One second. Yeah. Pull them down. Okay. So here we go. So this, this we build the person DLL with CL, which is a Microsoft compiler. This is person CPP, which automatically it'll generate person.dll. And then G++, we build the use person, which generates, I think, an a.exe. So the implementation is built with MSVC, and uh, the actual program where we use it with the main is built with G++. All right, any questions? Go ahead. Uh, you might want to clarify to people why that's significant. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, OK, so OK, so basically you've got two completely different code bases, you know, two different front ends, two different back ends. The exception handling between the two is completely different. Um, you know, the way um, the exception handling is completely different. Their C runtime is completely different. Uh, their standard library is completely different. The string in the MSVC is a um, short string optimization string. The string in G++ is a ref counted string. And, you know, basically we're passing them back and forth across each other. And if one of them were to throw an exception, it would not, it would actually, you know, kind of translate it onto the other side as well. Yes. So you'd have to publish the exception class using this uh, library. Well, the exception, well, basically well, what I'm doing is I'm cheating a little bit. Um, basically, I'm basically doing the same thing that most other people are doing at basically the module level boundaries. And on one side, translating the exceptions to like an error code, 32-bit error code. And, you know, for lack of a, you know, anything better alternative, I'm actually using you know, basically a 32-bit integer, just like H result, not really caring about the format, but basically everything less than zero, every negative number is an error. And then I've got a set of except, you know, so we can map it from a section on one side, to return an error code, and then map it to the other side and throw an exception again. So, the, so that's how that's working, you know, which is a lot of, you know, like I said, if, if you were doing this manually, you'd be doing it, you know, by hand or with macros or with a preprocessor or with uh, language extension. Here we're basically just using C++11. All right. Yes? Okay, so now we're going to extend it a little bit. So we are. Second, this seems to. Have.
There we go. All right. So near we are now going to extend this. So this is same as before. So we're going to add a constructor to this. You know, because it'd be nice if we could pass in a string. So person. Um, so this is the same as before. Now you've got this thing called a person factory. So it looks like an interface, same as before. And we define two functions, create, create with name. So actually the, the name of the function does not matter. All that matters is a signature. We can name this foo and foo1 if we wanted. So we've got a default constructor and one that takes a name as a parameter. All right, so then same thing, person ID. And here's the, so we have a runtime class again. So we have the object interfaces, which is our person. And then we add something called a factory interface. We can only have one. And it's the person factory for a person RT. And then everything's the same as before. Any questions? So we're basically saying this is our thing. This is our runtime class. We've got these interfaces for the object. And then we've got these constructor interfaces. All right, so this is our, so this is our implementation. So you just define a constructor, nothing differently. So this, this will basically map the implementation of the construct of the, of that factory interface um, to the constructor based on the types of the parameters. And then everything else is the same. And then for... Our user here. And it prints John and John too. Any questions about here? Yes. Um, I'm wondering what happens if you recompile person, but you don't recompile name. What happens? If you recompile person and I don't recompile uh, the main program using the, the use person. Okay, so I, I I don't recompile this one, correct? Yep. Okay, so I so I'm still using the person here, correct? Okay. So, so it's the same code as you had from before. Uh huh. But you now what you've done is you've got off to recompile the, um, the DLL. The DLL. Okay. It now has an extra constructor, but this code, one of the did not know it had an extra constructor. Okay. So basically, you've got to keep the you you have to keep the runtime classes across each other the same. So in this one, you know, you might actually you know old person whatever. So but basically, if you are so this would actually fail at it would actually fail. This, if you didn't do that, this would actually fail at compile time because it doesn't know that you've got a constructor. Okay, and can I clarify by fail? Yes. Uh, do you mean safe fault, uh, a useful error message, or? You would get template spew, unfortunately. Um, hang on, sorry. How do you mean by template spew? Because if you recompile the DLL, and now you have the DLL sitting there, and you now run the main program, it's just still going to be linked against the DLL, so there's not going to be any template spew. So basically what this is going to say is, so the person P, so it's got that basically, so let me just see, go ahead. It means the other way around, that you've got the old main okay. without the constructor, but you recompile the DLL. Is that what you mean? Okay, okay, okay. So the question is, okay, so I upgrade this and the person who supplies the DLL has not upgraded. <laughs> no. <laughs> Yes, yes. The DLL has the constructor, but the program doesn't know it. Okay, the DLL has a constructor, the, pers the program does not know it. And am I, am I still trying to pass John or am I just going P? I'm still going P. In that case, there would be a runtime exception saying that it could not create it. So you are storing a fingerprint um, of the API exported by the component, and then when you come to load it in, it checks the so what, 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 what is going on is there is, 
Good, good question. So let me repeat it. Question is, am I checking uh, ABI matches? There we go. Let me just open up um, the, the header file here. All right. So right here, where it says factory interface, so just so you know, this, so this, this stuff, you can put in any order. The order doesn't matter. You just have to specify what they are. Uh, but you know, to keep things simple, whenever you don't specify a factory interface, there's, there's an interface that's implicitly specified called default constructor factory interface or something like that. And that interface has a UUID associated with that. So on construction, it will say, give me the the you know the factory interface so that old so the old code not knowing that it's got the i person factory it'll ask for the cpp components you know default no constructor interface that interface this thing will return saying i don't have that interface and then that'll throw an exception you know something like interface not available or something like that okay. yes I guess I'm not understanding this mapping that you said uh, when you're defining the, the constructors, you call them create uh -huh. person or whatever. How are they create, create name? But you might have other methods that have the same, you said it matched by signature. You had to have the same signature. Methods that match by the same, I'm, I guess I'm not following. So basically for like a constructor, you can't differentiate by name, you can only differentiate by signature. So it's, um, let me see, so it's kind of like the same thing. So the name doesn't really matter. All we have, it doesn't take any parameters. And basically what this CPP components construction is doing, you know, we'll get into this moment. It basically, it creates its weakened introspect on all the parameter types of the methods of an interface at compile time. So we basically, you know, at com we have basically there's a little bit of metaprogramming in there to go say, you know, I, I, I received this, you know, thing, you know, from the user side, I received these parameters in the constructor, find me the interface function that matches these parameters and call it for me. And then on the implementation side, there's something that says, you know, you know, for, every, for the implementation for this interface, for this method, call the constructor with these parameters. So it's a combination of that, um, this thing sets up the, um, basically the, inter, the enough, informa enough like type info uh, implementation to be able to do that. Any other questions? Yes. I guess the question that I'd be curious about is under what circumstances can you recompile either side of the boundary without uh, re rebuilding the other and have it still work at runtime? So in this particular case, I see that the old name would have been asking for the old no args constructor. Correct. We've supplied a different no args constructor, so we've replaced a method on the uh, PLL side. Right. I see why that wouldn't work. But um, okay. are there cases in which you could rebuild just one or the other and it would still work at runtime without having to rebuild both despite Correct. additions to the API? Okay, so the question is, are there situations where we could, you know, stay out of sync with rebuilding them and still have it work to be able to evolve the ABI? Uh, yes, there is. Um, the, with a, uh, I person, with the, interface, you can define that it inherits from another interface. So we could define another, you know, we could define an iFactory person too and add create, you know, with, you know, name and social security number and add it to that thing, right? So when, you know, something that's compiled with it looking at, it'll ask for iPerson factory too, get that back. However, the original program will still ask for iPerson factory, and since you know, since uh, inherited interface supports its parent, it'll get that one back, and it could it could use that without um, without recompilation. Okay. All right.
right, so next, we will All right, so next, so this is our next step, so this is example three. We're going to take what we had there, and this time we're going to add a static to it, to person. Um, so we're going to add get population, return an int. Right, so it looks just like everything else. Then we add this thing, static interface, person statics. Now this thing, now, like I said, with, with this thing, we could add this feature and still be able to be used by the client that didn't know about it. Okay, so this is how we implement it. this is how we implement it. So implement person, you know, we still have our constructor. And then we just have a static variable count. We increment the count. When we construct, decrement it on destruction, you know, same as always. And we just say static in 32T get population. And, you know, the, the same, you know, th this will automatically map from, map the implementation of that static interface to a static function in your in your implement person. And then using it, here, get population. You know, so basically, even, even, you know, like I said, our, you know, our specification for the interfaces and the runtime class, it, like I said, it's a little complex. Our implementation is a little bit less so, but our usage is, is you know, it's, you know, I assume, you know, with the caveat that this is a reference type, you know, our usage is, you know, what you'd expect from, you know, kind of just using regular C++. You know, we're still, we're using, you know, in, we have real return values, you know, not passing in, you know, addresses of stuff to get stuff back. Any questions on that so far? So how does this work? You know, go ahead, question. Uh, it was just something that strikes me is that um, it seems to me, am I right in saying this, that uh, for a component that you're exporting, you have to effectively write out twice as much code. So you'll write out the class definition, and then you'll have to effectively duplicate that class definition to say what the component definition is. Would that be an accurate assessment? Uh, the, the question is, for the, uh, you know, for the, um, when you create a component, you're, you're duplicating the definition of it. You, you write the definition in the header file, and then in the implementation file, it's almost the same as the header file. Is that your question? That would be my question. Yes. Um, that, is, that is correct. And I really don't see a way around that type of thing. Anything you want, anytime you want to, basically you're wanting to separate the interface of it from the implementation. You know, there's different ways we can go about it. You know, one is, you know, there's IDL, which, you know, tries to do the same thing in, you know, which like, you know, the other, like, you know, like COM or, you know, so however thing they use, you know, they often use IDL for the interface definition language. And then there's some other, you know, preprocessor compiler that'll generate, you know, some C++ code that you then implement. Or else, you know, if you use something like, uh, you know, C++ CX or, you know, C++ CLR, that metadata is generated by a special purpose compiler. Um, my, hope, my thing was, you know, let's see if we can generate that metadata in C++. You know, a language you're familiar, we don't need another tool, there's not another tool to maintain, and let the C++ compiler generate that for us. Um, and, you know, I would hold that, you know, 
doing it this way is probably not that much longer than if you did it manually in something like IDL or something. The only way I think you could get better with, is with uh, built-in compiler support. I'm just thinking of a Clang library that would um, generate it for you. Yeah, Clang would be nice, yeah. Right, but like I said, you know, you know, and then, like I said, you know, it's, you know, but like I said, we, we've got something to output to, and, you know, I bet, you know, Clang could do that, you know, make it, you know, nicer. But, there any questions? We have, so how does this work? So I gave a talk last year on binary cross-compatible interfaces. Uh, it was very, very code heavy, not as much you know, usage examples, and we went into a lot of detail over some. So I will, uh, for some of the details, refer to that talk about how we got there, what the design process was, and some background about call and cross interfaces, but I'll, I'll summarize that for you. So this builds on and extends last year's talk. We borrow many ideas and terminology from um, from uh, COM uh, and WinRT, the implementation doesn't use any C, uh, COM or WinRT, uses only C++11 to be portable. There's a little bit of asterisk by that. So these are our assumptions, but they're commonly implemented. Number one is that we can specify packing to, gen to generate and create identical binary layouts of a trivial structure across two compilers. Uh, most things support the Pragma Pack 1 for trivial type structures, basically because you know, a lot of the platform ABIs rely on them. You know, they will work across the compiler. So this, you know, like I said, works on MS GCC, Clang, and um, GCC on Linux. And then we're able to specify platform calling conventions for a static member function. So theoretically, like a C, uh, extern C function and a uh, static member function can have different calling conventions. But there's, you know, but the compilers that are currently out there support a way to either make them the same or else they make them the same by, by default. Okay, so these are from last year's talk. So how does this work? So this, this is the heart of what enables, so basically we're going to talk about the cross-compiler stuff. So when I say a, the cross-compiler interface, I'm talking about the lower level, bit level thing. When I say CPP component interface, I'm talking about the high level thing that we defined. Uh, is everybody good there? So basically, you know, basically we have this, you know, basically a, a, a function pointer. And portable base is basically a, uh, has a V pointer, points to like a table of function pointers. Then we would dive from there. And then for our purposes, we add another pointer to some extra data that we use. And we'll go over what we do with that differently. And then we have a thing that based on the size of our V table, you know, how many functions were declared, we, you know, we generate like a, an array of that. So data and then the V table. N. And then we have something where you can get the portable base. Any questions so far? All right, so this is the cross compiler interface. This is what CPP, uh, this is what that uh, CPP components um, uh, construct. This is what it creates for you under the hood. So this is how we define an interface at the low level. So we have a struct, a template, uh, T, and then uh, we inherit from something called define interface. But basically, we had this thing called a cross function. And, it's, and we, we give it an ID where the zeroth one, the first one, and then we have, you know, like a you know, STD function type signature there. Um, and then we had initialized with the this pointer, you know, in the constructor. And what this is doing is because it gets to this point, a cross function can, and this eventually inherits from either portable base, if it's an implementation, or you know, something that holds a portable base there. So based on that, and this T tells us, basically we pass in a different type saying, are we going to use this, or are we going to implement it? So on both sides, cross function basically overloads operator, the function call operator, and it basically goes in there and indexes into the, into the uh, cross, into the portable base, that v, uh, v table, cast that pointer, and you're allowed to do that in, by the C standard, to 
basically something derived from the type of this and calls that. When it's doing a, when it's on the implementation side, when T tells it's an implementation side, uh, what it's doing, it's basically assigning a function to that that will, you know, call out and go to the, um, uh, you know, to our high level function. All right, so let's look at some code here. Right. So this is nice and buried. So basically, so V table caller. So this basically tell uh, basically the operators uh, operator function call operator uses this V table caller to actually do the call. Um, and this is a little bit modified from the code just to simplify things a little bit. Um, so basically, it takes the return type what the parameters are, and it exports a thing called strat, uh, V table func. Um, and it basically takes the, the function pointer, which is the void, you know, which was that uh, void, um, you know, not taking any parameters function pointer that we had from the V table, takes the pointer to the portable base, and then takes all the parameters. I mean, it does a little bit something to just keep a void from needless copying, but this is good enough for now. So the heart of this is something called, there's a cross conversion, and there's a, uh, either cross conversion or cross conversion return. So these are, these are basically template types that are specialized to say, I have this type, give me a trivial type that I can use either for return or I can use to pass in stuff. So basically it you know, sets up, and return is a little bit hard, so it sets up, you know, creates the uh, trivial type for the return, initializes it based on specialization, and then you know, detail call just casts, you know, you know, the return value of the parameters and calls that function. So basically it can casts, it casts the, that uh, original, the p fun, p point, uh, pointer fun void to, you know, so this type of function and calls it uh, passing in the, the um, portable base and then all the um, conversion parameters that are converted to their trivial types. And then basically if it if the return value is less than zero it'll map there's something called map exception from error code so it'll throw an exception otherwise it will finalize the return and then return the return value. Any questions? Yes, go ahead. So how do you how do you support custom parameters? Well, we, we do support custom parameters. Basically, um, it's not in this talk, but I've actually got how to do it. Basically what you had to do is you have to override that cross conversion, um, that cross conversion for your type that you want. And basically, that involves specifying a um, uh, specifying a um, trivial type that you can use, and then how to get there to there and back again. And then there's a default uh, return thing. I, I will show you a little bit how that works for like string. Okay. This looks scary, and uh, I don't know how many. Uh, internal compiler errors I got before I found out the right formulation to make this compile across all, because across uh, Visual C++, Clang, and GCC. But anyway, so it's not exactly like this, but this is close enough. So we take the uh, parameter n, so that tells us where we are in our V table. So which uh, V table function, what the parameters are. And then we take 
this thing which looks ugly. So basically we take a class C which is, a cl which is basically a class and MF which is a member function point, member function pointer type and then a member function of that thing and then the return value. The reason we take that because the compiler knows at compile time what the member function is, it can basically instead of doing indirect call to that member function can do it at um, compile time or you know basically decide what it's going to call compile time. So what we do is we grab our vtable base with vtable end base, we know we're on the implementation side of it so we can convert from the portable base to the vtable end base we, we, uh, we get the data, remember we had the data in the vtable n, and we get the, and that data there, so there's a way that we can store a function pointer to it. Sorry, the class pointer that, that'll be implementing it. And then we call uh, cross conversion do return, which helps with the return value, and we'll look about that more. And then um, we pass, uh, we pass, we convert all these, um, converted types back to the original types and um, as well as the return type and then we return zero and if that throws an exception we map it back to an error code in return. Any questions? Alright and so you were talking about how our how we went from there to... All right, so we're going to talk about, okay, how, does, how do we implement a custom type? Um, there's a little bit more, but at the basic level, here's how we do it. So this is how string works. Um, Cross-compiler interface, it's all in something that's surrounded by um, the, you know, pragma pack, you know, pragma pack push one, I think, and then, you know, pragma pack pop. Um, just to be doubly safe for some things, I think this on the compilers will come out to the attribute packed one, I think, uh, the extension stuff. So basically, so we have this, you know, so basically we're going to do a conversion for basic string. So we type def, what we're converting to as our original type, type def this thing, which is a trivial type, to our converted type. And then we are, then to go to our converted type, we just red.begin is s.data, red.end is s.data.size return, right? So we're doing it, you know, before we call across. And then to go back to original type, you know, we just, reconst we just reconstruct a string, uh, begin and end. Now the problem with that is your returns are going to be, right, you're, you're going to return, if you use this for returning, you're going to be returning to basically, you know, dead memory. So you want your returns to be different than your parameter passing because your memory types are different. So basically, we define this cross conversion return, which you can specialize as well if you want to do some stuff. There's some stuff that specializes it to, for, as an optimization, but this thing will do it in general. If it's a trivial type, it'll just pass it across as a return thing. If it's not, it will end up creating this structure. So basically what this structure is, is a function pointer called transfer um, that will transfer something to a destination from a converted type. And then we store the destination. So this, this is what this does. This is what the transfer function is. And this transfer com function comes from the calling side of it. So basically, we use our p destination, that pointer that we've got, to go back to our calling destination, which in that case might be a string, and then we convert it to our original type. Um, and then if there's an error, you know, we, we trap an exception and return an error code. So then we override initialize return, which says this is the return type, 
and this is the converted type. So return type would be string, converted type would be, you know, that structure that we have. And we say the transfer function is a do transfer, the destination is there. Now this thing gets called before we call, so we're still on our side of the ABI. And then the do return, well the do return says, okay, I've got the converted function, transfer it. So that way you can, so on your, you know, on the DLL say you're, you're calling, you say call this function that will transfer the data back into that return type. So, so this is how you would go about, you know, you override these two functions and then you can go, you know, that, that you specialize that um, template and then you can define your own custom types. On the project page for that one, if you look under wiki, it's not off the index pages, but there's a thing that that will walk you through defining a uh, custom type if you want to. Okay, so out of the box, what do we support for uh, for parameter and return types? You can pass in unsigned car, W car, car 16, car 32. You can pass in int 8, 16, 32, 64, float, double. Uh, you can pass in the const, all pointers, constant pointers, and constant references of the above. You can pass in void and bool. You can pass in basic string, vector, pair, tuple, and then the chrono time points and chrono durations. Uh, and then for the C++ string ref, you can pass in uh, C++, the C++ component string ref. It's basically the same thing as the boost version. A uh, couple modifications. One was to make sure that it was, trivially, it was a trivial class, so it had to do something with some of the default copy constructors. And then I added a modification to be able to tell if a string is null terminated or not. Because with this current string ref, if you have a string ref, you can't tell if there's a null at the end of it. And it doesn't matter as long as you're processing that. But the minute you want to say create a wrapper for like a C library, there's a lot of them that expect you to pass in a uh, null terminated string. So if you don't have that information, you're either struck saying, you know, well, I hope they got it right and pass that in, or else I'm going to be safe and allocate an STD string or with a null terminated and do it. This allows you to be, you know, to be able to tell if, hey, is this null terminated or not? So you have, so if it is null terminated, you can pass that in. Otherwise, you can allocate memory and pass that in that way. Uh, it also supports CPP component use. This is what we use for our interfaces. Um, we can talk more about that. And then CPP components function. So this is basically an analog of STD function. The reason I didn't support, directly support STD function is because to be able to pass them across efficiently, you had to be able to get at the internals of STD function. And basically, so what, if you try to do that, what you do is you'd be adding a wrapping layer on each round trip across. So you'd add your layer and then, you know, one across and then coming back you'd add another layer so it would just grow there so you know if you want to pass a function type you can use uh, CPP components function. Okay so we'll, we'll just look at the stuff so define interface we saw that um, so what it takes it takes the UUID and it takes a default base class of interface unknown which is basically I unknown um, so it provides you know it does the stuff with the UUID. So that way, because of the UUID is unique, this will be a unique type, and therefore, and we can also query for it at runtime. So interface unknown, I call it interface unknown because I know it'll probably clash with a bunch of other stuff, but it basically provides query interface, add ref, and release. And it is that, the implementation is actually binary compatible with COM. So all of your, all of your stuff that you're creating are basically COM interfaces at, uh, at an ABI level, except for the types. So UUID takes, basically we take, you know, eight bits there, four, four, and then we, we, t we use a UNT 64T uh, for the, sorry, for the number of bytes, and then um, basically, so basically it allows you to pass it in canonical format. Okay, CPP components construct. Uh, this does a lot of stuff. Basically what it's doing is you declare those, you're declaring your uh, functions for the interface 
uh, this is basically taking those based on the type of those functions. It is creating that interface we talked about earlier with the cross functions and filling them out correctly. It's also creating a bunch of kind of like uh, introspection info, basically what the, you know, basically all the type names of the cross functions that it's generating. So, uh, so this information is what's used to allow the mapping between, um, uh, between um, the constructors and the static functions. Um, it also creates a couple of like, helper functions to be able to map from the names of the functions down to the type of, um, down, down to the implementation type transparently. Use, so it provides the ability to call interface functions and it manages reference counting for you. Runtime class, uh, this assembles the various interfaces into a coherent whole. Use runtime class inherits from each of the object interfaces and then it maps the static function calls to static interfaces, maps constructor calls to factory interfaces. And then implement runtime class, it provides the interface of the runtime class, it provides the interface on known implementation, it maps the object interfaces all to member functions. Note after the first interface, just in case there's a, a collision, it, uh, the first one maps them straight to the function name. After the second one, it'll map them to interface underscore function. This is just an implementation detail, it is transparent on the user side. Um, maps the static interfaces to the static functions. And then what it does, it has a static variable of a class that implements the factory and static interfaces. So the factory and static interfaces, their implementation is actually created at, you know, is uh, created as a static variable. And then it registers itself in a, in a factory map saying, hey, if you're looking for a factory with this name on it, that's me. So then we had the macro CPP components register. So basically all it does is create in an anonymous namespace, creates this variable that'll never be used and a function that'll never be used, basically to force the static variable implement interface to get instantiated. Otherwise it doesn't get instantiated and, um, and then the constructor never registers. Yet, so we don't know that it's there. Any question? Uh, CPP components define factory. So this is what it looks like. It's a little bit long. All right, so this defines our exported functions. These are the only three functions that actually get exported from a um, from the from the uh, library. Um, so basically, something called get components factory that says, "Hey, pass me a character string, get me back the components factory, get me back something that'll provide the factory and static interfaces." Um, something that says, "Hey, am I still in use? Do I have, you know, are there outstanding reference counts?" And then the last one is basically to say, "Initialize it." module initialize, and then we'll go over what those are used for um, in a little bit. Yes? Uh, how quick safe is all of this? Okay, so the goal is to be thread safe. Uh, there are locks around some critical structures. Most of these structures are only happening at initialization time. You know, this gets up, then the rest of it is read-only stuff. So the question was, how thread safe is this? The goal is to be thread safe and be able to use it if it's, you know, modulo bugs in the implementation. Um, I was just wondering, I mean, if you had multiple threads all loading multiple components simultaneously from multiple threads, how well does that work? Um, so basically there, let's see if I talk about this. So the question is, if there are multiple threads attempting to load multiple components, you know, at the same time, you know, how, how does that work? Um, and basically, there, the, uh, in the executable itself, 
so the executable, it maintains basically it's a cache of all the modules that have been opened. And access to that one is serialized. So basically it's, you know, it's like a, if it's not in there, it will add it to it and, um, you know, and then serve it out of that one. And then uh, you saw that function where it says initialize and it was passed some pointers. So every module actually gets passed a interface pointer back to that, you know, the master one. So it's synchronized across all the different like DLLs or SO files. So even if different ones are calling them, they're all going to the same local place. So that way everything is, uh, is in, in, um, in sync. So how does this, so the active, so how does constructing a runtime factory, uh, use runtime class work? So we asked for an activation factory for runtime class ID. That was the you know, person, um, bang person. Uh, and then we query interface for our factory interface. So this was where you were asking about if they were compiled out of sync, how it would fail at runtime with an exception. Uh, and then this is actually the, the syntax that you use for query interface. You know, so that you're not passing in uh, UUID by hand or anything like that. You just pass in what factory interface you want and the, it returns that. Uh, and then based on what types were passed in, we call the appropriate interface function. Uh, how do we get the activation factory? Well, we look up the module that implement, implements that class, runtime class ID. We load and initialize that module if necessary, otherwise we cache it. Ask the module to provide us the activation factory if it implements it. And that module, will ha there's a local factory map for all the stuff. Remember, we had the register implementation. Um, so in which the constructors of the factory static uh, implementation registers themselves and it returns that. So basically we have this thing called iString factory creator, which may not be the greatest name. But anyway, this is the one that's kind of like the master list of managing what modules get loaded and unloaded. So it has several of these functions. One is the add mapping. So you can map from a class name to a module name if you want to. Uh, get class factory given a class name. It'll try to get the class factory. It'll get the class factory if you want to give it a module name and a class name. There's something called free unused modules. It'll look through those, ask them, hey, do you have any ref counts outstanding and free those. And uh, this actually, so there's only one copy of this across the entire, you know, across all the DLLs plus the executable. Um, so basically the runtime class IDs are of the form module class name. So you have person, uh, person. So by default, module, we'll, by default, if we don't do anything, we'll load the module either .dll or .so file that's, and ask the module for the activation factory for that. If the module is absent, we'll look if there's a prefix mapping. So a prefix max will also, so the add mapping method from before, that allows us to override it. So instead of naming it person, person, I just called it person. And then I had to add a mapping because it doesn't know what module that is. Say, hey, map everything that starts with, say, PER to person.dll, and it would do that. Um, this is useful, say, if you're implementing stuff, you know, kind of like backwards, you know, my company dot division dot thing, you can, you know, you can map a bunch of, um, class names into you know a few modules. If it's of the form bang class name, it'll only look in the local factory map. So you can use something if you want to create something that you want to use locally, just in that module. Don't want the rest of it to see it, kind of like a private thing. You know, you can do that. So how modules are loaded? We use load library on Windows or DL Open on Linux. We call the exported function uh, components module initialize, passing an iString factory creator. And then that one, then the module itself sells. Whenever I need to look up something, I use this thing. And this makes, change, makes us sure that the changes that, you know, that we change across from the class IDs to the module mapping remains consistent across our whole instantiation. So we can use this to get like a very simple form of dependency injection. Any questions so far? All right, beyond the basics. So we're going to look at uh, simple dependency injection.
Okay, so let's say you know we're using something, so our you know our modules may want to print something, right? So we can't have every you know, but the main exe is the only one that knows exactly how it wants to output something, you know, because you know you may you have a different standard library implementation, so everybody can't just go calling C out, you know. This the actual executable may be you know a GUI program that it wants to redirect somewhere. So how do we make sure that everybody's consistent? So let's say so we create like something called I output, and we have something called print string, print string s. And um, we have a thing called just called output, and we create the runtime RT and the output. Same as before with the person. Any questions? And then we have our person not H. Same as before, but we added a method. You know, in reality, we change the UUID or add, add it as a different uh, interface or something, and say, say hello. And this will output that. And then here's, here's our implementation, say hello. So we include output.h and go output print string, hello plus name. And so when we do this, this will actually use the implementation that was provided by in the use person and uh, you know, use that to output it. So basically we implement our implement output and then we say this is our output for print string. So if I'll instead of using a uh, you know, console app, say I'm using you know, I'm writing a GUI app. Instead of this one, I just say output to an edit box, output to a static library. Or if I'm writing a web thing, output, you know, output is part of the web page. And, uh, you know, and my changes will work across all the modules that rely on this. Any questions so far? All right. We'll skip over this generally. There's a way, the way, because of the way we can have either overloads or templated functions, there's a way to be able to add them in there. Uh, we can talk about it a little bit later. You can come talk to me afterward. Basically, there's something called, TP can call it interface extras, static interface extras. And then we can actually even have templated constructors in there that will map to the, uh, map, map to like, um, the underlying type. And then we can have parameterized in interfaces. And the trick with that thing is we need our, um, U our UUIDs to be unique. And the way we do that, we actually use the version f 5 UUIDs. And there's, in Boost a UUID, there's actually an SHA1 name generator. And so we abstract that with something called combine UUIDs, that we can combine the UUIDs based on template parameters so that we can, um, generate a version 5 UUID and so that we can guarantee that each interface is actually unique even across its template instantiations. All right. Sometimes say for working with plugins, we want to load a uh, module explicitly. And, you know, you just have a list of list of names of stuff and you want to Load it explicitly, you can also do that as well. So I create, so let's say, you know, our person stuff is the same, and I'm going to create these two things, one called you know, bandela.personh, we use the same thing, implementation. So every time you assign a name, I put bandela behind it. And then I, I have a smith one, and, every, and this does the same thing every time it does a smith name behind it. So then in my use person, person has something called dynamic creator 
that if you pass in a, a module name and a person ID, it'll use that one to actually create it. And the open parentheses close for just calls the, you know, just the default constructor. And then if I output these, for this one I'll get John Bandela, for this one I'll get John Smith. So like I said, you know, you, you know, makes plugin creation or extension, you know, fairly easy. And then finally, we have um, call by name, whereas, you know, sometimes we're wanting to, you know, if we're in interacting with scripting languages or other things, we can basically, you know, we want to be able to, instead of calling it by the vtable, call by name. So let's say we've got, you know, we've got this thing called math, and we have uh, add, you know, we add stuff, and then we have this interface math that has add, and then uh, we define an interface called dynamic, but basically it's called a call by name interface. And there's a, in CPP components, there's a function called make a call by name interface uh, for any other given type of interface. It can make something that'll call by name. And then you can use that to basically do, you know, do stuff dynamically. So this is just a little function that says, hey, tell me what modules you want to load. Loads the module. Say, hey, call, enter a function name. And based on that, it'll call, it'll call a function name, passing in the parameters. All right. Uh, any questions up to this point? So this is just all the stuff with uh, CPP components proper. Yes? Well, both of them are loaded with F vi with the visibility hidden. On Windows, I'm basically statically compiling it, and the memory management is all managed, you know, is all managed on by the module itself. So we never call new or you know new or delete. It manage it. It'll create something for us when it's done. It'll destroy something for us. So it'll keep them that way separately. And you know, uh, at least on Windows, like I said, you know, the underlying principle works. You know, for you know, mainly with, uh, you know, like COM modules are themselves allowed to use, you know, different run times, you know, to keep ABI stability. So that's how we're using it. That's how it works. All right. And then just uh, one more thing. So, you know, all this stuff is good for, you know, just your synchronous stuff. But, you know, what about, you know, nowadays that everybody is going to, um, you know, multi-threading, asynchronous stuff? So, you know, just some of the stuff we were working on to do that. So basically we've got, so I implemented type of channels. Uh, some of the executors from the executors proposal, but making them interfaces, you know, modifying them in that way. And then an await based on uh, uh, boost uh, um, coroutine. So basically you can have a function, let's say you've got a printer, and it receives a channel of int32s, and basically it says await is future whenever the channel tries to read, whenever it becomes available, I test if there's an error code. If it is, I return, otherwise I output whatever that value is. And then I've got a generator. So let's just say I'm going from 0 to i equals 0, i is less than 10, i plus plus, and then call a wait on the channel dot write. So the channel dot write won't, the future, it returns a future, and the future actually won't return, won't, re, won't be completed until somebody reads from it. So that way this keeps them both in sync. And then at the end it calls channel dot complete saying, hey, there's no more writes going to happen to this channel. So we've got a loop executor, we create it, we make our channel. Um, COA sync is kind of in the same thing as the new async proposal that takes a executor, uh, but this thing actually makes it a coroutine so you can use the, uh, 
await on it. And then there's also win all implementation for um, when all when all both of these are done, it calls make loop exit, which is an analog, you know, of what is you know what is in the proposal there. Um, calls loop on it, and then it calls f one dot get at any t at the end to see if they threw any exceptions and to rethrow them. This thing will actually go through and you know on, on a single loop on a single thread will print out one two three four five six seven eight nine. All right, where do we want to go in the future with it? So what am, what am I working currently? So um, an ASIO-based implementation of executors and async network IO and timers. Based on that, so basically you can build it once and be able to use it across various implementations. Boost coroutine-based await implementation. Um, work on maybe using a, a nice wrapper for libcurls that, you know, easy to, you know, just say, hey, want to download a web page, scrape it asynchronously, be able to do that for you. And then maybe starting work on a C++, you know, on a package manager. Use this tiny technology to create a package manager. Future plans, port to Mac, you know, maybe do remote components over the network, you know, kind of the same stuff where the constructor was mapping to, you know, you know, to constructors and interface functions, map those to network calls on either side of the interfaces. Maybe a QML JavaScript interface using that call by name stuff so you could, you know, easily just create a component and be able to call into it. Um, you know, possibly if there's demand for it, a COM or WinRT wrappers to be able to use this type of thing to actually create, you know, the platform specific stuff and an HTTP server library. So the code is at CPP at this address. Try it out. Give me a feedback. Tell me what you think. If there's an existing library that you like that you're always getting tired of recompiling and rebuilding whenever you try to upgrade compilers or do anything, write a C++ component module. If you have any questions or any things, I'm happy to help you with that. Uh, feel free to contact me. And uh, you know, let's you know, let's try this out and you know, see if we can build you know, like a larger ecosystem for you know, readily used CPP C++ components. I'll be happy to take any questions. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, I first want to say uh, thank you very much for presenting this. Um, it's something which is we, we continually ignore in C++, and we keep adding lots of fancy new compile plan features. We, we ignore ABI management. I think it's become uh, an impediment to the future longevity of C++. Um, and as you know, John, uh, I've done my own presentation. Right. It's very different from yours, actually. <laughs> but I hadn't quite realized just how different I would say that for wider adoption of this, I do think we need something to help with the generation of the interface files. Um, if you remember back when COM first came out, we had to write that pretty much the IDL by hand. And then someone quickly realized, well, we can build in a tool that we can inspect the code. Right. Create some IDL for us. That eventually evolved into .NET. And, uh, you know, <laughs> quite successful in what it was. Uh, and I'm still thinking here that uh, it, I'm not necessarily saying that the tool set should automatically generate the, the interface files straight off, because a lot of the time you don't want that, because that would mean that the interface would change as quickly as you change the source code. Right. Bad. But what you do want is, if I come along and I add some, some method, um, you know, foo to some particular class, I probably would quite like it if the tool set went off and generated a new initial default implementation wrapper for that. It, mm -hmm. it shouldn't really go off and modify ones that I modify. So if I modify a parameter, I mm -hmm. want that to be echoed into the interface mm -hmm. by default. Right. Um, but it would be handy if that happened. And certainly, it seems to me that libclang um, would be a very quick and easy way of uh, getting the appropriate interface files to be generated out. So that's my first observation. And um, I was hoping maybe with your roadmap, you might want to perhaps think of that. The second thing I was going to suggest is that the COM integration, specifically the WinRT integration, I think that that is an underestimated value add. Um, as much as certainly a lot of people at the conference here, especially because of the ongoing problems with Visual Studio, we tend to focus a lot on Unix and POSIX and OSX, um, and Windows isn't as prioritized as perhaps you know, it should be given its, its, its position in the marketplace. And, um, if we had a, 
I mean, Microsoft have their own set of extensions to integrate C++ with, uh, with IT, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's great, but none of it's portable. Whereas this at least offers the chance that you can write one set of code with one set of componentization, and you'll have a component system that runs on Linux, on OS X, and on Windows. And basically, fair enough, it might be a WinRT model throughout, but that's actually probably not terrible um, in the bigger picture of things. And uh, I was just hoping, basically, um, you might consider perhaps bumping up the, the WinRT com integration. Because certainly one of the things I noticed was that uh, you require the types to be passed in and out by browser. They're a very limited set. And because of that, I can certainly see that uh, in my future use of what I'm intending to use your, your library for, that um, the fact that you are limited to effectively you're repacking each of the STL types that go through every single time. I can see that as being a performance issue is the first thing. Uh, I can see it also that people are going to complain that when you have everything compiled by Visual Studio from top to bottom, and you're still repacking <laughs> the parameters every time they go through uh, an interface boundary. Uh, I can see that as being an issue, and I can see that the fact that you can't just pass in any old arbitrary type which is right. on both sides as being another issue. You have to wrap them all up with conversion, conversion types. And again, this is something where an automated tool could do a lot of the, 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 the heavy lifting for you, and then afterwards you tweak it as appropriate. So um, those are all my observations, and it's a great talk, and uh, this is the stuff that you know, we need to really think about for C++ 17 in a big way. All right, thank you for this. Let me just repeat it for the camera. Let me just <laughs> let me just summarize. Okay, you heard it fine. Okay, so yeah, th thank you very much. Um, yeah, especially you know, you know, like I said, I think you know, in terms of in generating initial I the initial interface, you know, like you know, you write write an implementation file, or something or something that says, hey, I've got this code here. This is a class I have here that I use. Make it a uh, you know, CP please components. You know, make it compatible with it, and it'll generate the you know generate the uh, interfaces for it, and that you can use it. So with COM and WinRT, um, that's something I've been thinking about. Basically, my call by name is almost iDispatch, just with a different name, and um, ac and also that you know where that, that runtime class ID, you know now it's a constant curve, whereas basically all it is is changing to H string in. Um, in, uh, to use it with WinRT. I mean, there's a little bit of stuff. So some of the stuff I built in are actually templates that you can parameterize that. And I actually had a little while ago a WinRT version of this that actually let you r use Microsoft WinRT components from GCC. And um, and, you're, and to address the other issue about, you know, we're packing and repacking types across. I agree that's an issue. A better, a solution to that would basically, you'd have to create types, an ABI stable type, you know, that say, okay, this is the type that we're going to use. And that one you could pass around everywhere. Whether you make it via an interface, like the CPP components function, or however you're doing, you know, you could have your own string type that's, you know, that's specific to this one. Um, that is a possibility. One is we're going to have to get everybody to agree on it, and two is I didn't want to introduce another string type because everybody's going to say, "Oh, I had to throw out my old, you know, my code that works. I want to be able to use C++, not some, you know, not some crazy thing that you have addition." Where if this becomes bigger, greater, more adopted, and um, you know, there's a demand for it, you know, the performance things, you know, that that would be something that would be, you know, fairly simple to add. Um, and um, I thank you for your uh, question. Any other questions or comments? All right, then uh, I guess we'll finish five minutes early. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, have a great rest of the day.